It's about to go down with Mark and Kathy, a live coaching show about dropping ideas. Mark and Kathy coach and have conversations with brilliant idea creators who are reimagining the world through the expression of their words, thoughts, and actions. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to It's About to Go Down. I am Mark Williams. And I'm Kathy Ermias, and we have Brittany Zimmerman with us. I'm so excited. Mark, do you know what Brittany's done? This is so, like, all oh, right? Like, the, nobody does this, I, I think, I feel like. Brittany has had this <laughs> long career, even though she looks like she's 21, in the space industry. Yeah, but, and she's worked on things like how to habitate on other planets. Is that not wild? Um, but what's really cool about her, her entire career has kind of boiled down to what she's doing today, which is super exciting. She's taken all of that stuff that she's done, and now she's working on how to utilize all of that, all of those geeky fun things that we're going to talk about and how to use them for what she calls earth applications. Wow, that just blows my mind right there. Um, but not only that, but to solve some of our biggest challenges on earth. And one of them being climate. So that's kind of her big space right now. Brittany, welcome to the show. Your idea is this, and I love this um, because this is the way you laid it out. You said that every single person on this planet has a role to play um, in this space of, of climate issues and challenges but it's not what we think. Ooh, yeah. exciting. Yeah. Is that a little cliffhanger? Is it leave it a little exciting? <laughs> leave it, just know leave what it, it is. for a second. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're excited. Welcome to the show. And yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So for me, you know, I think this idea really originated coming from the space industry and moving into the climate sector. There was a little bit of a learning curve that had to happen. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of the technology side of things down. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I do things like air revitalization. So how do I manipulate the environment or the atmosphere or, you know, the technologies that provide the gases that we're breathing or we're scrubbing out? Um, that's a big part of what I do, right, for other planets and for spacecraft and for space suits. But there's a big application for that here on Earth, obviously, as we're going through climate issues. I work on things like water reclamation technologies. So how do we recycle water when we're on other habitats, when, you know, we're in extreme space environments where if you lose the water in any way, it doesn't come back, right? It's something you have to launch or you have to go find in situ, which is on another celestial body somewhere. And... I had all these techie side of the things down. And for me, when I started looking at, okay, this has a major application to the existential issues that we're facing on earth. I wanna start bridging that gap, right? I wanna, I wanna bring these two divisions together because we've learned so much from the space industry in the past. We have Velcro and memory, you know, memory foam and we have cell phones. We have all these fantastic things that originated because of the requirements that were put on us to develop technologies in space, but they have applications here on Earth. But I think we've done a pretty bad job, unfortunately, as times get, you know, more troubled and more divisions are drawn between countries and IP issues get further and further restricted. We ended up not doing, I don't think, in any capacity, even close to what we should be doing in terms of technology transfer and information sharing between what we're learning in the space industry and what we could be doing, especially in terms of terrestrial human betterment or earth applications, because we just developed so much technology in this realm and a lot of it is shelved, a lot of it's put away. Some of it is utilized, but then not shared or made simpler, right? And um, so, I started looking at this, okay, we're in space and I wanna bring this stuff to earth and here's the crossovers. I had all that part. The part that I didn't have is, I think I had a lot of the same information in the climate space that you might see on TV or you might read about in a magazine or you might talk about with your friends while you're you know, strolling down the street or whatever it happens to be. It was very superficial, I would say, information at that point in time. And the deeper that I dove into what's going on and more of the sustainability and climate space, the more I started to realize a bit of a paradox for me. And that was A, right? It maybe it was more of a dichotomy than a, than a paradox. But for me, it was, I had this, I don't know if it's like a intrinsic guilt that's placed in us as consumers right? It's like, I don't want to use plastic products. 
um, right? I don't want to use things that you throw away often, or I don't want to get in my car and drive if I could ride my bike, or, you know, I think that as the individuals, we assume this just insanely heavy amount of guilt and responsibility. Almost nobody makes a big difference to actually change it. Like we don't make the actual changes that would be necessary because I think it's against a lot of our human instinct and a lot, which is comfort to some degrees. But it does, you know, it does do something to us, I think, on an emotional standpoint where we feel you know, that level of guilt when we sit down and we think about it and we realize how long our drive is to the, you know, grocery store or into the office or, and we think that we have this humongous hand in the issues that we're facing in terms of what's happening in climate. And we do our best job to separate our recycling and our garbage and we we do what we can with this level of guilt. And um, I think that's, is that fair to say? I think that's a pretty broad you know, that's me projecting what I think other people feel because that's what I felt before I started diving in to the sector. And for me, through a lot of my investigations, and that's really, you know, where the idea comes from. And, and one of the things I want to share is the we all should play a role in climate action. Like, we all have a role in it, but it's not this stop using your plastics and bike to work every day and give up your comforts as a human. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where mm. it started. Oh, and I, I cannot wait to, to dive into that. I mean, you, <laughs> do you hear what she's saying, Mark? She's literally yes. saying, <laughs> she's saying that we, as I called it consumer guilt. When she was talking, I wrote it down and I was like, consumer guilt. Mm. I, I don't know. That, I don't know if that's a term or anything, but I, was I saying, don't know either. Yeah. I, I just, <laughs> I literally we'll, go with, we'll, go, we'll with go with it. We'll go with it. Yeah, consumer we'll, guilt. Yeah. We'll just go with it for a second because I feel like what she's saying, Mark, is that we've all been passed on this bill that is supposed to be paid up and, and the consumers have been handed the bill. Yeah. So I'm excited to hear what comes next, but um because I know I know where we're headed is there's a lot of there's probably a lot of myths that um, can be developed yeah. in this space. In fact, Brittany, I'll ask you that as the first question. That might be a fun little question to ask you. What's like the biggest myth in this area? If you were to just say like, oh, biggest myth. Oh my, there are so many of them. I have so many soapboxes. Oh. Do you have like I, a top five that you could just like spell yeah, off? Yeah, for, uh... for me, the biggest Ooh. one is recycling. Oh my gosh, it mm-hmm. irks me like to the deepest core mm-hmm. of my body. And that is as you dive in, right. So, all right, let's start from a surface level and then we'll just like work our way down a little bit. Okay. So on, on the... On the surface level, recycling is awesome, right? We Mm -hmm. all want circularity. We all want the products that we utilize to go to something else or be reused. We're all on board there. I think that's a mindset that's fair. Um, The way that it's actually being implemented or not being implemented or what's actually happening behind the curtains is a little bit terrifying and scary in real life Mm -hmm. implementation. First of all, almost nothing is actually recycled. As consumers, we separate our you know in in different states is different in different counties right your glass and your plastic or you can put all your recycling in one whatever it happens to be we go through the effort of separating what we consider right our trash that goes in we know goes into the landfill and then what we are really proud we're recycling right and we have a different bin and we pay a different fee and and then you look at what's happening in our minds. I think at least in my mind, it was, this is getting picked up. It goes in a different truck and then it goes to a recycling facility. And then they put it in some machine and they like heat it up or grind it down and then make it into a new bottle or a new plastic or a new glass, or I don't know. That's just where my mind was at before digging into it. Right? Like those are the assumptions that I made. Mm -hmm. And then I see products that say, Oh, you know, 20% 20% recycled material or something along the lines. I'm like, oh yeah, see that I made a good assumption. This is because I threw my stuff into a recycling bin and it ended up somewhere and it got processed in these ways that I imagined. And now they're in this new bottle that I'm consuming, right? Well, it turns out that when you dive down the rabbit hole, it's it's a really terrifying area. First of all, in most places, I currently living in Hawaii, all of it's put into the landfill. So there is not a, you still separate your green waste and your plastics and your recyclables, but it all goes into the landfill because the truth of the matter is we don't have 
a ton of recycling. We were really sold on the idea of recycling. They tried to implement it in some to some degrees, but in its actuality, we don't do a whole bunch of recycling. And that's just one thing. I, I like the idea of at least there being effort putting it, you know, put into that sector. But the part that really grinds my bones is that a lot of the stuff, because you've separated it, actually ends up doing more damage to the environment than if you would have just thrown it into the landfill. And that part hurts. So if you take a look at glass, for example, okay, you throw your glass in the landfill, it goes in the landfill. It's pretty inert. Not too many bad things are emitted because of the glass that's there, right? So do I want there to be a pile of glass in a landfill? No, of course not. But the alternative right now, and what is happening in a lot of places, is that that glass is actually taken to the recycling center. The recycling center, A, has now, you have paid, right, to have your recycling taken away. And now what they do is they actually take that glass and they sell it to the abrasives industry. So glass is actually like ground down as a grit and the, and the abrasives industry releases horrible toxins and does very, very damaging things to the environment. So I've now paid to have my glass ground down and providing input to an industry that is entirely destructive. Not entirely, that's unfair, but extremely destructive, right, mm -hmm. to, the, to the environment. Mm -hmm. So it kind of feels like a sham. It's like, wait a minute, I paid you to do this, but now you're making a whole bunch of money on top of that because they're selling the glass off. So you're making money from me. Wait, and you're making money from these you know, abrasive organizations that are utilizing these in ways that would go against everything that I stood for when I was separating it and paying you to take mm -hmm. away my rubbish, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like that in a lot of, in a lot of the different goods, unfortunately. And uh, I think that is one of the ones where I was like, wait a minute, if recycling's, you know, greenwashing to some degree, well, what the heck else? <laughs> like, I thought that was the foundation, right? Recycle yeah, yeah. reuse, yeah. And it's like, okay, we need to start digging deeper into what's happening in a lot of these. And that's what really started my investigation of looking like as far as I could up the supply chain and looking at things that are called LCAs, which is a life cycle assessment, and looking at that from a cradle to cradle. So instead of just what's happening during the life of a product, what happens in the manufacturing of the product, the transport of the product, the use of the project, product, and the disposal of it as well. Mm. So, That's yeah, the there's thing. a lot of these soapboxes. <laughs> so, okay. I know, yeah. right? I've watched. It's funny, too, because you, you picked one, uh, Brittany, that Mark and I, I think, probably have a lot of, there's a lot of varying degrees in our cities about how we hand, how we mm. think it might be handled. Because Mark's yeah. in New York City, I'm in Portland. I think Portland is very huge on like, oh, we all have to recycle. And yeah. thinking that it's going somewhere that it might not. And Mark, I know I've been in New York a ton and I know that there's a lot of waste that's very prevalent to the city and people are in the middle of the city and they they don't have an opportunity to really recycle and maybe they feel guilty about it or not. I don't even know. I'm not trying to put on any of that onto the whole, a whole, you know, a whole lot of millions of people. But again, uh, Brittany's bringing up an interesting point of like, where do, where do most consumers think that the, these products are yeah. going? You know, yeah. it's interesting. You know, uh, it, it, it is interesting. And um, you're right. We're on different sides of, I like to say we're on different sides of the planet as we're having this conversation. Um, <laughs> but now your plan has been exp expanded further because she's in Hawaii. That's even further than I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, Brittany, I got to tell you, um, nowhere as enlightening as what you just shared. But everybody knows I, 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 I've been a teacher. I worked in a school building and in classrooms, at mm -hmm. least in New York, they have three bins in the front mm -hmm. of the classroom. Right, yeah. and we are, we encourage the children and the teachers to put things in the proper bin. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I remember I don't know if it's changed, but I remember when I was in the school building, we were told, "Don't even do that," because when they throw the trash out, forget about at the landfill in the in school the they <laughs> throw everything in the same bag anyway <laughs> yeah absolutely that still happens a lot in several of the places that i've worked most recently you know um gone in and we're talking it's, it's the same case so um 
Yeah, and I think it saves a lot of issue. Like, at least you don't have to have a recycling truck come around to pick it all up just to go dump it in the landfill also, right? So there's there's a lot that's going on um, in that realm, Mark. So I'd be willing to bet it's it's still happening. So let me ask you this, Brittany. What, what would you... And maybe I don't want to even put it out as far as like you giving advice to everybody, but maybe what do you, so what have you done with that information? You know, it's a myth. So do you still recycle? Do you not? Like, how do you, what, what do you, what do you do? Oh, with that? Uh, I <laughs> developed a system that brings in all of the waste and all of the recycling and turns it into actual useful goods with no waste byproducts or streams. So, well, of yeah, course, that's, that's a- <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. Exactly that's why we're talking to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, you know, I didn't want to do that. I just developed my own. Like, it's, yeah. is this something that you use at, at home? Like, tell us about, tell us more about that. Oh, yeah. So, you know, in the investigation of how do I want to make the biggest impact on climate? So just to be fair, this was all about carbon at the beginning. It had very little to do with waste. It had very little to do with recycling. For me, it was how do I balance the carbon that's causing the issues, you know, in the climate space right now? And for me, right, we're looking at a lot of CO2. We're looking at a lot of methane. And what happens as just I'm sure most people are aware, but right, we have this release of greenhouse gases and now we we lose the ability to reflect a lot of the heat that is typically directed at us right towards the sun. We direct a lot of that back out towards space and instead of it being directed out towards, you know, the beautiful space location where we use it as a sink, it actually stays and it radiates here. So um, it does a lot of different things um, in terms of major impacts. Uh, there are people on a lot of different sides of this spectrum, but there are some things we that are inarguable, right? It is inarguable that there is more there is more than twice the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now than when humans were evolving. So that's an, an, an inarguable fact. Um, so we look specifically at CO2 and it's like, okay, people can argue about what the effects are, what the temperature effects are, you know, what climate change is in, in any direction that they'd like to, but if you look even past that and you look at, okay, we see a lot of things happening obviously in the environment, um, but also what are the effect on people in terms of health, right? I think that's one of the things that gets overlooked often. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, all these bad things are happening, right? We see the icebergs, you know, are melting, the sea levels are rising, the temperature is increasing, wildfires Mm -hmm. are increasing, droughts and rain and all this chaos. Okay, I think we've all been inundated, I think, a lot with a lot of that imagery and what's going on, right, in the climate space. It's important. But at the same time, we also have a scientific unknown. Like, we have we have several question marks that are that are occurring. And for me, a big one is, as humans evolved, right, CO2 partial pressures in our atmosphere ebbed and flowed, right? It was cyclical. That's very natural. But even at its peak, it, it never surpassed 300 parts per million. So now that we're over 420 parts per million, right, since we've seen this giant increase since the Industrial Revolution, it's like we don't even fully understand what the impact of consuming something that's a poison to us is, you know, at higher doses for long duration. So for me, you know, it's whatever motivates you, you know, <laughs> and th- that's something that motivates me a lot. Uh, certainly the environmental part of it motivates me uh, to an, ex- an extreme degree also. Um, but I feel like regardless of whether you're in it for, you know, the sustainability and the environmental side of it, or if you're, you know, self-interested and are interested in health of us in our future, like there should be common interest amongst most people, right? Using all would be rough, but most. And um, so for me, is a really big motivator too, right? And as we as we lose a lot of the mass of our ice caps, we don't really have a strong understanding of what's in all of that too. So there's another big question mark. It's what are we releasing that we don't even know we're fighting yet? You know, it's it's, it's got that element of mystery and it really is rolling the dice. And while I do like gambling, I not I don't like gambling at that degree. That's that's just a little too much. <laughs> yeah. So for me, those are my big motivations and why I really focused on the climate space. And also, right, water is a big issue. Agriculture and access to food are really big issues. And for me, it's like, well, climate affects our water cycles and the climate affects right the agriculture. So it would be really silly of me to work on these things that are ultimately, there's something higher up on the pyramid that is affecting them regardless of, right, what I'm doing in terms of 
approach or making iterative progress. So I decided to really focus on the climate part of this and all the waste management and all of the you know reusable and recyclable building materials and the net negative products and and the water and and clean energy that all really came as a byproduct of the effort to focus on a scalable and profitable solution because to me it had to be both right those are the major requirements and it was it has to be scalable because I'm not interested in, in band-aid solutions. We look around, mm -hmm. you know, and we see some of the largest carbon capture facilities are raising $600 million to remove three and a half seconds of our annual emissions. Like, mm -hmm. oh, thanks. Yeah, th wonderful. Yeah, that's that makes a whole bunch of sense, except for it doesn't. Um, and then, you know, and then, th and then there's that. And then you look at in other directions also, and it's like, okay, well, there's a whole bunch of different approaches, but they're all taking like these tiny little chunks. And even when you sum them all together, right, I think as an entire nation, right, all of our carbon capture removing technologies, you know, as of last year equated to like 0.000025% of our emissions. What? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, wow. you graph that and you can't even see it. You know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and and it's like wow. we have driven at full speed towards the edge of this cliff for so long that we don't get to just think about slowing down anymore you know it's like we need to put this bad boy in reverse we're gonna be in a you know the environment's gonna be fine right the the earth is gonna survive it's us that's not um mm -hmm. you know it's our our children and our children's children that are really you know biting the the bullet here um you know, for our non-sacrifice and for our non-forward thinking. You know, Brittany, you used the word motivation earlier as you then started to talk about how it's not so much the environment, but it's us as humans and our children and our grandchildren who will be affected. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious about that piece. Because one of the things you said to us is, listen, you clearly know so much about this. Um, and, and one of my favorite terms is you could geek out on this or you could nerd out on this <laughs> yes. and talk completely above our heads. And you could be so much into it. I'm like, wait, Brittany, you lost me, right? Oh, no. You didn't lose me when you started talking about our health. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the questions you asked was, What's the effect on our health? Mm, oh, and, yeah. yeah, you know, I'm reading, I, I actually just started reading this book. Kathy, I don't know if you um, read the book Made to Stick. Have oh, you read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so at, I, I guess because I just started it today, it's got me thinking about how do you take something and make it memorable, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I think for a general audience is how we're affected, especially in terms of our health. Like that's mm -hmm. tangible. Yeah. Me throwing that Coke can into the blue garbage can. Yeah, the landfill, uh, uh, the, the abrasive. Yep. Uh, but you tell me that something is going to happen horribly wrong with my body, yep. either on the inside or the in outside. And I'm listening. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what the butterfly or domino effect would be. But what's, what could be one of the most, I don't know if I'm going to say graphic, but I'll use the word graphic, side effects of not taking care of this planet? Oh, of not taking care of the planet? I mean, obviously, yes. total, total, yeah, in, us in being not on the planet yeah, yeah, anymore, yeah. I think is the biggest one. <laughs> But in, it, to speak to what I what I think the spirit of the question is, I think you you mean in terms of like human health and longevity and issues, you know, in that sense, you know, I think it'd be really interesting to look at. And I, there there's a whole nother side of this we probably shouldn't get into on here because it, it gets really political really fast. Um, so we'll try to steer away from that. Maybe that's episode two. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, but the effects of carbon dioxide um, on the human body is something that is decently well known, right? I I designed spacesuits and spacecraft. There are OSHA levels, Mm -hmm. right, that we know about in terms of, you know, we can't we can't exceed them or you have to evacuate buildings because there are side effects to this. It's legitimately a poison in our body that we're exhaling and getting rid of on purpose. It's because we're not supposed to be consuming it at these levels. Um, what that looks like in terms of, you know, doubling the amount in our breathing air, you know, I mean, at a minimum, it's reducing the amount of oxygen and other things that we can bring into our body. It's taking up the, you know, the place and capacity in our lungs for that, even if it had no effect, right? And it was just, you know, a zero, it's at least doing that. We're getting less oxygen in each of our breaths, you know, so mental capacity is for sure something, whether it has effects on DNA, I have no idea. That's definitely for a medical professional of some sort. Um, What it's gonna do in terms of evolution, right? Evolution actually works a lot faster than we think it does. So even exposing a couple of generations to these increasing levels of of carbon dioxide and gases, I think will have long-term effect you know, and definitely in, in, in mental capacities because, right, our, the mental side of our body for sure is highly dependent on access to oxygen and functioning and neurons and, and you know, and, and physical too, I'm sure, right? I think we'd be able to see things, you know, if we, we did testing, you know, of exposure of different species that have shorter lifespans, I think we could get to the bottom of that quickly and maybe some of that testing has been done before, but, um, I'm not well well versed in you know in the in the animal testing of CO2 yeah at those levels I, I've seen it at high levels and um, so we know where our evacuation limits are and and it's one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately also and we won't go down the political side but I think that a lot of the things that happened on you know mask wearing um, during the COVID pandemic there's there's implications to a lot a lot of the decisions that we have made at at a large scale for another time. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for another time. I want to bridge yes. the gap really quick though too, because Mark, I think you started heading down a path that I really like. Um, Brittany, obviously we do. I mean, I feel like I get mini PhD or mini masters in, in different uh, you know areas of, <laughs> of, of topics that you talk on, which also make me feel like I don't know Jack. <laughs> Mark, right? You're like, you're almost a school I teacher. And I feel like, hello. Yeah, I feel that way all the way, Kathy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's awesome. Like, I also, at the same time, I don't want to just dumb it down and say, we feel dumb talking to you. We're both intelligent people. And I think we both sure. really re- appreciate, and from a heart perspective, appreciate the work that you do. I, at least I know I do immensely. And I, I think, Mark, you were getting somewhere that I love because I could see it from a distance. It's like, you're reading the book Made to Stick. And there's even things in made to stick that they talked about that like you could tell somebody, Oh, I remember one in particular, every time you smoke a cigarette, I, some, they, somebody told me this. I mean, we watched some films and stuff when I was in my second, third grade. And they said, every time you smoke a cigarette, you know, eight minutes of your life, you're going to take off with every one cigarette. And it's the thing people don't, there's no, that, even that doesn't feel tangible to people because it's not the immediate effect. Right. Yeah. And I think, Brittany, a lot of the things that you're talking about is like, we're in the middle almost of the immediate effect, but we still don't even know it. Like it's this weird. And so I think bridging the gap here is like, how would we get, what is the thing that Brittany needs to say that would help so many of us to be in front of that, you know, that big moving car that's heading, you know, 180 miles an hour. And the Brit and putting it in reverse isn't going to work unless there's a- another shift on the other side. And I think that's what you're saying yeah. is like, and so how I would bridge this gap is how do we get everybody to care about it? In my mind, if you were giving a Ted talk on it tomorrow, and then it became like the number one Ted talk immediately in the world, people were like, Oh my God, what she said is true. We need to do something. And this is what I could do. What would, yeah. what would those things be? Because I think yes if we need the inertia of everybody doing the right things, not the things that we've been greenwashed. And for anybody who doesn't know greenwashing is- I love that greenwashing. I know, right? yeah. it, it's just that you're kind of being brainwashed with how, how you know, how to appear to be green or whatever. So um, yeah, tell me that. I mean, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause mm-hmm. I think that's what's more, more important because Brittany, you're doing the work, but the rest of us, 
who might think we are doing the work aren't actually doing the work. We're not doing jack. We're not doing jack here, it turns out. It's right, because I put my glass. And, I'm, and I'm just making these worse. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and that's what I mean. Like, I feel like there's been this, right, this coming kind of bridging back to where we started there's this guilt that we feel as consumers that is so misplaced right just Mm -hmm. almost all of the all of the greenhouse gases almost all of it is produced you know from large corporations large corporations are the main polluters in all of the industries, you know, and how they have kind of passed that buck onto the consumers in order, I think, to stay out of the limelight, right? If we're upset with ourselves for the pollution, I think it really redirects us from, you know, thinking, wait a minute, why why aren't these companies finding more sustainable or effective ways? I still want my products, but you guys should find better ways of producing it because the ways that you're currently producing it are causing destruction to my health, to my children's health, to the environment, right? To the climate issues that we're facing. And that's a very, very expensive thing to have brought onto large organizations and companies. So investing, I think the amount of funds or the you know appropriate funds in order to kind of push that consumer guilt, it, it pays off you know, in terms of dividends in, in the long run and not having to go through and retrofit all of the technologies that are emissive because there's a lot of them, you know? And, and for me, like one of the things that I think is passed around a lot, it's another one of these cliches that drive me nuts is there isn't a silver bullet solution to X, Y, Z, you know, there isn't. And it's like, people get so comfortable saying that, that I, 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 it drives me nuts. I mean, it's like, I can't think of a way that would demotivate somebody from looking for a solution faster than saying that. I mean, it's like, it's like, oh, why would I even try coming up with a solution to climate change? Because it's just going to be a bunch of these little things. And then what I'm going to produce is just a little thing. And like, you know, we want to, we want to do something meaningful. Like we want to do something big and it feels like a whole bunch of effort for a little bit of nothing, you know, in that viewpoint. So I really dislike this. There isn't a silver bullet. It's like, yeah, there is. There's a silver bullet to damn near everything uh, in the entire world. And, you know, it's it's motivate people to look for that. Like the closer that we can get to finding that silver bullet, the better. And the idea, you know, and that light that that, that is possible to achieve doesn't put a glass ceiling, ceiling up. Right. The other the other philosophy that's been, I think, forced on us is that, you know, that there is a glass ceiling and I think it's rather demotivational. So mm. when I say we all have a role to play in climate change and it's not us separating our stuff and stop driving our cars and giving up our luxuries. No, it's not that at all. It's every, almost every single industry has an emissive part of it. Like let's band together and figure out how to decarbonize the things that we want to have. I mean, there's no reason that we can't have those in a sustainable fashion, right? And and for me, right, I, I started with the carbon. I'm like, how do I remove the carbon from the atmosphere? How do I remove the carbon from the ocean? And I, I didn't get on that too much. But as we pollute the atmosphere, we hit a steady state, right? And that steady state is basically an equilibrium of your carbons or your greenhouse gases between the atmosphere and your oceans and your sediment or your rocks, right? Our three major players on earth. And so it all doesn't stay in the air. Some of it goes, some of it goes into rocks, some of it goes into the ocean, right? And right now the ocean is a really big sponge for us. It holds a whole bunch of our carbon dioxide for us for millennia at a time. There's a very long, you know, think of it as this it takes a long time for the ocean to make a full rotation right in terms of its water and at the bottom it stores just an insane amount of carbon for us and over time if we are just dumping a whole bunch of carbon into it right now well then think of that as just like making a pocket that later it'll come up and then that's a problem for you know humanity way in the future when that what, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So also it's like a sponge. Um, I like to use that analogy because right, a sponge is dry and you can drip water on it and you can creep dripping water on it for a really long time until all of a sudden your sponge is not holding the water anymore. Right. It's it's coming out and we're starting to approach the limits for, you know, where we I, I, we're past the limits where I feel comfortable. 
um, in terms of how much carbon we have put into our oceans. It's acidifying our oceans. People talk about ocean acidity, I think, a lot without having a really good understanding of actually what that means, right? It's the pH, right? It's like an acid versus a base, right? We've kind of learned about that in science class before, but mm -hmm. we're making it more and more of an acid. And, and why is that happening? Well, carbon dioxide is acidic, right? And we're, we're, we're filling our sponge up full of acid. Oh, well, who cares? What implication does that have on me? Well, it has a lot of implications. There's all these different layers right? Kind of, you guys know that the, the atmosphere has different layers that have different properties. Well, the ocean is exactly the same. The ocean has all these different layers in it, right? And different layers are responsible for different things. I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but there's a there's an area of it. It's called the hypoxic zone, which is really interesting to me because we experience hypoxia in space, right? That's an issue we see in space, but it's, it's named appropriately. It's, it's basically the lack of oxygen, right? Hypoxia is with, without oxygen. And this layer is a hard place for for anything that utilizes air to survive, right? The gills don't work really well because there is no oxygen to extract from this layer. So there are animals that can pass through it, yes, but there aren't a lot of animals that can survive in it. Well, what's happening is that hypoxic, that hypoxic layer is expanding. It's pushing closer and closer and closer to the surface. Well, what does that mean? That means the amount of area where our animals can actually live in the ocean is decreasing, right? Not only that, but we're actually pushing the species closer to the surface, which has different temperature profiles, has different implications versus, you know, on how easily they can be fished, spotted, removed, right? How much light is, is you know, is, is affecting them. And we're causing a snowball effect in what's happening. We're not only acidifying, and only some of our creatures can move, right? You see our coral reefs dying and everything. Well, those coral reefs don't have the ability to just swim out of the hypoxic zone like our animal friends do, right? I mean, they're animals too. I didn't, yeah, there was a, yeah, I misspoke there, right? They're also animals. Um, but it's like, they're immobile animals, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, what, what do we do now in terms of, of starting to rectify these issues? Because, you know, it's, it's a snowball being pushed over a hill and it's, you know, at some point in time, the snowball is too big to stop. Like we need to, we need to make sure we're stopping that momentum or at least helping put it in the right direction because our entire life depends on that ocean, right? But the, ocean is responsible for almost every other breath that you take. You don't think about that, right? I think as a normal person, we think, oh, the Amazon rainforest is where a lot of the oxygen is produced, right? The trees do it all. No, the trees don't do it all. The ocean does a humongous portion of our oxygen generation. And almost every other breath that you take is because of the living components that are changing, right? all of the things that you know about photosynthesis and, and, and producing oxygen for us. So even if you're in the middle of Kansas, you still rely on the ocean, right? You're not removed from this at all. Like your ability to breathe is dependent on the animals in the ocean surviving. Mm. So I don't know what, what, yeah, what rabbit hole I just went down, I'm sorry. <laughs> you but, know, I, I'm glad you went down that rabbit hole because for me, kind of going back to what Kathy said, the immediate effect. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about breathing and when you said almost every breath you take, and I don't want to, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, the phrase, I can't breathe. You talk about going into politics. Clearly, yeah. that is a very heated a and, and political, touchy yeah. subject. Um but I was thinking about my youngest son, right? Who's gonna be a sixth grader. Yeah. And I was just thinking, after I jump out of this idea conversation with Brittany, and I go to my youngest son and I try to explain to him why we need to change our habits, right? Why he needs to really consider his role. If I told him that his breathing is going to be affected. Mm. Yeah. That yeah. might, and, and maybe I'm only speaking from, for, for this one particular child. Mm -hmm. 
that might freak him out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I know there's something to be said about scare tactics and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I was just and, thinking that much. Yeah, and, you know, Kathy always talks about how, I always love how you say, Kathy, about how we're, we're, we're kind of motivated by pain. Or, you know, wow. I, I, I was, yeah, I was, I was get the, the so eloquent way that you put it. I love it. Um, but that's so universal to me. Yeah. Too. And I keep thinking about, you know, that immediate effect, which was a term that Kathy used. And how do you talk about that immediate effect so that the everyday person doesn't think, you know what? I'm going to leave this up to Brittany. <laughs> Brittany's doing all of that work out there and she's going to save the planet and I'm going to keep putting my can in the blue, you know, garbage disposal or whatever. She'll take care of it. Mm-hmm. But maybe I will play a role once I know that my last breath depends on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. I, I know that I definitely got a really clear let's say understanding of when, when you were explaining it Brittany and how much the ocean is has been absorbing if you will all of the the carbon that you know is, is kind of sedating on the bottom of the ocean and then in my mind I could see it like filling up and even though the most of the world is ocean it's like that's that that, that was a that was a grim picture for me to think that of all the oceans across the entire planet that we're just filling them up and there's all these secondary third fourth fifth effects that are happening and we have misplaced our we kept our eyes off the ball we didn't keep our eye on the ball like yeah. we kind of we got we allowed ourselves to you know misdirect some of our some of our efforts and uh it totally, yeah, you know, you know, Mark, that, that saying that I always say is that people will do more to avoid pain than they will to go after gain. I mean, it's just, it's like a mm-hmm. psychology thing, right? We'll, we'll, sure. do, we'll do more to actually avoid pain if that's the thing, if we know the pain's going to be there, but we won't even, we won't even make that effort to go after gain. So if you were telling people, oh, you know, animals would live better and the, you know, the planet would be great. People would be like, awesome. Don't even want to do that. <laughs> you know sadly 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 sadly. but if you and most people right like that's just kind of like not not everybody obviously there's britney's in the world there's more than just britney that's in the world right um and yeah and but at the same time you know i think that we've been given this there there's a there's a worldwide message that's definitely been coming across and we haven't been hearing it the right way and i can even see the bigger effect of like um, there's systems put into place to make people look like fanatics when they do figure out the truth and then know what the truth is. And then they try oh, to tell yeah. other people, then it's like, Ooh, that person's a, that's like that we would term somebody like fanatical or yeah. you know, an extremist or something like that. Mm-hmm. All the while, while we're not paying attention to some of the things that are happening. Yeah. So again, yeah. I ask, <laughs> I'm going to go back to this again. I'm just, I'm like the Ted coach in me is like, Please like, do it. You gotta rein me in, woo! Kathy. You're gonna have to do it a lot. <laughs> well, it's it's, it's and then and, and again, I'm not I'm not going here to try to dumb the subject down or anything mm-hmm. at all. Please, this is more of like the TED coach in me is like people need to hear this. So I don't also want people to be a deer in the headlights and be frozen. What's the message that we would put out, and how would we motivate people? to do what you said. And I, if I got what you said, it, it's, it's to really, I wrote this down because I thought it was really good. It's to really focus on the different industries, like in this particular case, to decarbonize. Did I write that right down right? Yeah, like, yeah, de- decarbonization. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, for me, it's life cycle assessments is a big thing, right? It, don't worry about that. That's just nerdy stuff. All, all we need to really look at is what are the implications on the environment from the beginning of the project all the way to the death of the project, right? From the beginning to the end or the cradle to the grave, they say, but I like to look cradle to cradle. And um, for, you know, for me, it's, we, when I started this project, I was looking at carbon, right? My carbon solution pulls out atmospheric air and pulls all the, the pollution out. 
It pulls in oceanic water. I pull all the pollution out. And I bring in all of the waste feed stocks, right? Literally all the trash and the recyclable products. I bring that all in. And then I take all of the carbons out. I break everything down. I take their long chains. I break them down into their fundamental building blocks. And then I put them back together in a way that produces no waste. So there isn't a nasty exhaust stream. There isn't some terrible effluent that's coming out that gets dumped into the ocean. Oh, don't get me on that one. Um, there's just There's just so many, you know, beautiful examples in mother nature of how mother nature utilizes things there isn't there aren't waste products in nature right things decompose and become something else and and it's this beautiful this beautiful example for us to look at and for me that that's really where our team looked and it was like we we want to take this approach but let's look at something we know is already circular and that and that is our planet, right? Everything in, in our mm. atmosphere is beautiful in that way. And what is it? It produces rocks, it produces water, it produces mm. atmosphere, it produces soil. Okay. Well, what can I do to replicate that? Right? And can we put all these puzzle pieces that we've now created and put them back together in a way that makes sense? Right? And the way that I like to explain this to children when I'm explaining it to children is a bunch of people give me a whole bunch of their old Lego sets. They're all built up in all these different ways, but they're not really making anything cool. What I do is I take all the Legos apart and mm -hmm. I put the Legos back together into four super cool things and every single piece gets used. Mm -hmm. So there isn't an extra piece that's mm -hmm. left out. And then, you know, I, I think that helps them visualize what my system is doing without having to understand that organic chemistry. It's we bring all these wastes in, we break it down, we put it back together into something else where there isn't any waste. And right, we make a net negative concrete product. I didn't go into this thinking I was going to get into building material you know, and sustain, <laughs> sustainable construction. Like, that was never, you know, never in what I considered, my, you know, my purview at all. Let's and, go from the cool space industry. To yeah, yeah, to <laughs> making <laughs> concrete. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like something I want to do. You know, so I, I had no idea, right? Um, I had no, I didn't have an idea where the solution was going to take me, but, you know, looking at Mother Nature to put all those puzzle pieces or those Legos back together in a way that didn't create waste led us there, right? And then also the biochar materials, it's a soil, right? It's amendment product. It's, it's an alternative, a sustainable alternative to fertilizers. We are dumping horrible chemicals in terms of fertilizers and pesticides all over our lands. We're monocropping things. We are wreaking havoc on a beautiful environment that... It's so stupid to say we need to to figure out how to be sustainable. It's like we've been sustainable <laughs> for so long. It is only the recent history that we have moved away from that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many cultures. I'm in Hawaii right now. Right now, Hawaii had these beautiful. It's an island. It was self sustainable for its, you know, for as long as the Tahitians and the Polynesians came over here and 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 you know, popular. You know. It, it just, they had these beautiful, I'm going to get super worked up. They have these beautiful systems. They're called Ahupua'a systems. And they're basically communities built around the water, all the way from the top of the mountains where the springs were, all the way down to the ocean. And each of those communities was entirely self-sustainable. And most of the communities could provide enough food for the entire island mm. by themselves, mm. you know? And it's like, okay, um, that was not that far you know, in history. that It wasn't that long ago. We talk about these sustainable platforms and these new things as if they're these revolutionary ideas. And it's like, I mean, some of the technology is pretty revolutionary that helps us get back there. But the fundamentals are still the fundamentals. Mm. We're still dribbling. We're still shooting, right? We're still doing just the easy stuff. We're not trying to do any special tricks here. Like, you shouldn't be doing any of that stuff if you don't have those fundamentals. So what are the fundamentals? Because we have gotten really, really far away from the fundamentals. It's just about finding effective ways of getting back to that, right? And 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 that's exactly, you know, what we're doing. And and so it's it's so dependent on both the, the concrete material, you know, the soils and how we take care of things. Biochar is not a new material, right? It's not this fancy thing that was concocted. They utilize it. The Incans and the Mayans had, you know, terra preta, black earth, right? They knew how to do this. We just have to 
not lose the thousands of years of ancient history that gets typically passed on. It's like we just lit a match underneath a whole bunch of really beautiful information. Now we have to learn it all again, right? And this is the process of us learning that again because we took it for granted, right? We didn't pass the information on as we were supposed to. So, so it's that, it's also the water, right? Water is so important. How the heck did we end up in the situation that we're in right now with water? I mean, it just, it blows my mind. There is so much water on this planet. There is so much water. The idea that it is legal to tap a spring, take the water, put, put it in these bottles, and then sell it to the people who would have legally had rights to that water to make a profit is absolutely beyond me. It 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 hurts like it legitimately stings me at my human core you know it's one of those soapboxes you don't want to get me on so water is a core part of that how do we even move backwards from where we're at man that's a that's a hard one we have to be able to produce a lot of water right and for me the solution was we have a lot of oceanic access too how do we de desalinate appropriately how do we do that sustainably without producing brian and without producing all these things and that's really where all this has come together right so long story short kathy yes decarbonization of a lot of different industries but it has to be circular like as soon as we start saying what just each industry by itself we end up in that same problem again right like we have to take that circular systems approach to it and that's that's why I'm ending up touching all of these different industries when my initial goal was how do I balance carbon, right? And it's, yeah. well, it's more complicated than that. It's, it's everything is interwoven and everything touches each other and dialing this knob up has an effect downstream. And you have to, you have to see that and you have to forecast that and you have to be willing to work together with, the, with that group. So if you're, I think what you're asking for is what is the call to action, right? Like how do we pull together our call to action? And for me, like, I, I'm super excited about that. For me, it's like, get involved in projects that are, that are doing that. Because it's not just scientists, right? It's not just engineers who are coming up with these solutions, right? We need people in policy, equity, culture, communications, business plans, law, like, you could basically just put the word climate in front of almost any job role that currently exists and it is needed you know and so how do we band together in that sense in utilizing what your core competencies are and what your core strengths are to provide to that solution that global solution as a community instead of worrying about not driving your car and, and separating your bins I had it. I had it. Oh my God. Okay. That was very clear. And I had a thought when you were talking, Brittany, because I was thinking about it and I was like, you know, everybody sits really close to an industry. If you really mm -hmm. think about it, if yeah. you're not clearly in an industry, like you are close to one, right, Mark? Like, like I would say, for instance, you were sitting, if you would more to create, you could say education is the industry, mm -hmm. right? What is yeah, education? Yeah. What is it? How is education causing harm in, in this carbon um, mm. challenge? How can it help to decarbonize? Uh, it, if you're sitting in the cement industry, I used to be in the glass industry a long time yeah. ago, in my early 20s. I used to be in the glass machinery industry. Um, what if you're sitting, what if you feel like, I mean, there, there's an industry that sits close to you in some way, shape or form. And so that's probably the first step in making mm -hmm. is to connect on a human level with people and make them see where where they sit at in life. I know there's a lot of companies, Brittany, that are trying to go net zero carbon, you yeah. know, and they're trying to do that. And these are like various companies and, and they're trying to do it in various mm -hmm. ways and whatnot. So could mm -hmm. it be that you work for a company that's trying to do that, get involved? How do you be a, I mean, you even, you even said it at the beginning when I really, cause now I'm really just trying to break down. I'm now we're in that level. Where we're like, Oh, we're talking about like, what can people do? Mark, yeah. I'd love, I want to hear your thoughts, Mark. But she said it at the beginning too, is like, even Brittany with all of her knowledge and all of her expertise, expertise and experience and all these industries and some really geeky industries doing some really cool things. She had to like break down the recycling industry industry. She had to like 
swim past, no, no pun intended, and swimming in the oceans and stuff. <laughs> she had to swim past the, the like everything that was fed to her and get to the spot where it was like, oh no, things aren't happening the way I thought they were. So yes. I, I would think that people need to be aware first, right? They, they oh, ne- absolutely yeah. need to find, come up with their own. Like, if you want to know what climate change is about, do your own research, figure this out. I, I don't know. Mark, what are you, what are you thinking about that? Um, you know, I, I was so stuck on for a while, the recycling thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad that Brittany, you said a little earlier that it's not about that. And yeah. so Kathy, as you, as you, as you kind of clarified that for me as well, I thought, yeah, as an educator, right. As I'm in the classroom, or right, I'm working in an office building. I do wonder what could we do to decarbonize in, in our area? Mm-hmm. And and I can't say that an answer is coming to me quickly enough. Um, and I, I don't see that as but you could <laughs> research, right? Like, yes, 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 yes. Yes. <laughs> but that's what I love. That's what I love that you immediately said, Brittany, I have some ideas. Yep. And the fact that we're thinking about it, talking about it, looking to somebody who can actually give us some ideas, that's gold mine. Uh, 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 Brittany, give me, give, me one, give me one quick idea that as a classroom teacher, I could do to decarbonize. Yeah. I I have so many. I can do more than one. So first of all, right, we talked, I want to go back to your example where you said, you know, we put all these bins in and they all get thrown in the same spot. Just look into where is the, where is it going? Like, where is this actually go when I'm done with it? I think you could do that with almost every product ever, not even just the stuff you throw away with, like the computers that we're talking on right now, the glasses and the, the earbuds and the clothes that you're wearing, right? And the plants behind Kathy, like all of these things. Just think about where did they come from and where do, where do they go, right? And the, and I think just starting to think about products in that way is step one. Like where is everything coming from and where is everything going? Even guessing is good because then at least you're training your brain on how to think through it, right? Guessing and being incorrect is still better than not thinking about it at all, right? Uh, so it's really important. Yes. So I think getting people at a very young age, Mark, in a classroom starting to think about that is super awesome, right? It's like, hey, let's go down there and see what's actually happening. You might not have the solution for it, but at least you're not tricked into thinking the problem solved and the kids don't think they're, that the problem solved, which doesn't you know, speak to action, right? One of every 10,000 kids might be like, you know what, that's actually the problem that I want to solve. But if they don't know that it's a problem, they can't even take that approach because mm-hmm. we've we've kind of, you know, we've kind of painted this rosy picture over it so that the problems that need to be solved aren't even being addressed or even being recognized as problems. Also, a lot of schools are getting really big into the solar stuff right now. We should start having conversations about how solar is not actually sustainable, right? Like that's another one of these darn, you know, soapboxes I'll get on and it's like, okay, um, if we tell people that we have a solution, it's not actually sustainable, right? We can't actually do that for the long term, but people think that there's a solution in place. Everybody's like, oh yeah, electric vehicles and solar panel and wind, it's going to save us. No, if everybody was doing that, we would be in such a bad place. We would be in a very, very, very bad place, right? Mm-hmm. So it's having a full understanding. And we can get to the bottom of that again by thinking, where did this come from? And where does it go when I'm done? Right? Where does it come from? Oh, all of this stuff is actually still being mined, right? I need rare earth minerals to provide my my photovoltaics. Oh, a lot of water is needed actually in order to run over all of these solar panels. Oh, there's some leaching that happens. That's not really great. Oh, these only live for this many years. Oh, what happens to them? Oh, they're not recyclable. Oh, they poison these areas. Oh, and it starts all over again. You would start thinking, wait, is that, is it sustainable, right? If we just look at the fact that we're not utilizing fossil fuels, that seems like a pro, but there's a lot of fossil fuels that are utilized in the production of those photovoltaics and of those solar panels. Am I saying it's wrong to make small steps in 
a correct direction. No. But painting things as solutions when they are not solutions is one of the most devasta devastating things that we could do to our youth. So if I had the power in a school system, I would be working on educating that just from the get-go because marketing can trick anybody. I can tell people that this was sustainably made because like 1% less carbon was emitted. Yeah, but it, they don't tell you that, you know, it's still emitting insane amounts of carbon or, you know, there's a toxic stream that I pump out into the ocean because of the production of this, but now they're going to be buying this all the time because they think that it's sustainable. It's, it, it's wrong, you know, like that's what I think of as greenwashing. It's painting something as a sustainable solution or a green solution when it's just downright not. And there are scientific ways of evaluating that and getting people into the mindset of thinking where did it come from and where is it going is the first step in them being able to evaluate themselves so that they don't have to rely on the marketing materials of people who are profitably right extremely profitably motivated in order to lie about it wow. and can i just tell you you stepped on the soapbox you stepped off the soapbox you kicked the soapbox down the street you picked <laughs> it back up you stood back on it <laughs> i have a pyramid of soapboxes mark i have a lot of soapboxes oh. That was so awesome. And can I just tell you what, what it made me think is there are some of us who think that throwing the soda can into the blue can, problem solved. Done. Totally. Look what and I, I love, I love that you said <laughs> that's where we have to start, that we have to stop that. thinking that the problem is solved. Yeah. And asking where did it come from and where does it go i'm telling you i had this image of the perfect oh. island the perfect remote island no humanity <laughs> no 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 you know no no filtering no, nothing wrong yeah and then suddenly a bottle rolls up on the beach mm -hmm. and so it begins yeah all yeah. because we thought that when we threw it in the blue tinted can Problem solved. Problem solved. No problem. Wow. And oh. then you said earlier about the Lego mm. pieces. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Go ahead, Kathy. Oh, I was going to say, I'll even take it further because she, like, even I, I started feeling, I started feeling consumer guilt too. Cause then there's some of us that'll go, oh, I can take a bigger step than putting something in the blue, putting my can in the blue, you know, recycling bin. I can pay a lot of money to rewire my house with solar and the government might even give me a kickback. No. I have just done a really, I have, I have stepped up as the heavyweight. I have done my recycling, you know, deeds for the rest of my life. And then, and then starting to really think about her two questions. I, it's crazy, but you know, sometimes when we have these conversations, Brittany, we realize that sometimes it takes several, but then we get to this like really good thing. And I think when yeah. you said, asking yourself two questions, yeah. where did this come from and where is it going to go or where is it going? Well, and you even said something beyond that. You said, even guessing is better than not thinking about it at all. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, boom, I, I couldn't, I could imagine Mark having one of his conversations around the family, yeah, around the dinner table with the family. And he's like, let's just pick up a bunch of things. Where did this come from and where is it yes. going? Yes. Yeah. Where did this come yeah. from and where is it going? Where yeah. did this come from and where is it going? Like I could I pictured that. And so Brittany, I think we started hitting on something that um I felt started to bridge the connection to consumers. It started making me feel like I felt excited and close to it. Like what industries do I sit next to? What 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 are the things around me that I can say even if it's an industry wide like where did all of this come where's all this glass cement yeah. whatever you know waste whatever coming from where is it going or if it's just as down to a product where you take your kids and say hey let's go to a let's go to a toy manufacturing company and find out how they make these yeah where's all this plastic coming from where, yeah. where, is it, where is it all going when it when it when it goes away where is it going yep yeah. I know. I, that's what I took away from yes. it. No, yes. I, 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 I thought that was amazing. I thought that was amazing that, that you wrapped it up that way. And Brittany, I'm curious. Like, what did you just think of what Kathy just said? What did you think about some of the things that we've talked about? I mean, I got to tell you, you, you blew my mind today. I felt like I learned so much. Even the image of the ocean kind of going in this cycle and just 
taking everything that we've dumped inside of it and we think it's all gonna wash away and it's just wow i mean you just said so much you 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 i am going to go to the house and i <laughs> am going to ask everybody to pick something up um so that's something that's changed for me since mm -hmm. we started this conversation Brittany, and 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 there's got to be a part two and a part three to this most definitely <laughs> but so far so mm -hmm. far what has changed for you about this idea or, or what new thought has this sparked for you since for we sure. started this conversation? Yeah, I love this, Mark, because for me, I'm I'm a systems thinker and a long term thinker. So mm -hmm. sitting with you guys, I love the uh, what's the immediate, though, like what is the right now effect on me? Right. Like we can all daydream about what's going to happen or we can, you know, be philosophers or we can guess and do our analyses or whatever it is. And for me, that's all important. Right. Because of the, the, the mindset that I hold. But that, you know, what I think I'm getting from you guys and was just really helpful, too, is like we care about what the present like what is present me going to affect and what is present me going to feel right and that is a really good way of of communicating and it's really interesting because i implement some of those practices in in business but i i haven't i don't think i've made that i haven't bridged that into like the communication portion of it so i i really like that so i think that's one of my you know my favorite and personal um, takeaways also. And I think, you know, we kind of started, you know, with a, you know, on one platform too, it's like what everybody should do, right? Um, it, everybody has a role, what should everybody do? It, it's not what you think it is, right? Uh, sort of a thing. And I think we're coming to a more concrete idea through talking of what that actual call is on the back end because you know we can talk about it broadly but how do we continually just kind of pare that down to you know mark what your sticky whatever whatever sticks um yeah. in a way that it has enough information in it that there can be action but also that emotion and that connection to it so that it can be held on to amazingly said amazingly said Brittany. i said a little bit earlier in my industry, I couldn't even think of something. And then you said, boom, I got a, a thousand and one ideas, <laughs> right? I was like, give me one. And then it made me think for everybody else out there who's listening and watching, if they want to get in touch with you because they can't figure out how to decarbonize Please and they know that you me. might be the actor, yes. how do they get in touch with you? Yes, absolutely. I am the most active for sure on LinkedIn. So for LinkedIn users, um, I'll share with you guys my LinkedIn profile. But that's definitely where, you know, uh, publicly facing, I'm the most active. I'll also share my e my direct email address with you guys also. I think that would be number two. That's the best way to get a in contact with me. And that's Brittany at yame.com. I'll send you guys all that information so nice. that it can be nice. shared. Nice. Mm. All right. We're going to decarbonize this planet. Yes, we're going we to are. Do Earth application. And we're going to do, <laughs> I, you know, there were so many terms thrown out that I, I need to open up my textbook. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I need to go back to school, right? <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. Well, listen, for anybody who's watching, now you know how to decarbonize the planet, or at least you know how to start. And if you've got an idea that you now want to bring to Kathy and I so that you can start changing the thinking of people out there, hit us up at It's About to Go Down Show. Send us an email. If you know somebody who has an idea or Kathy, if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who wants to jump on that soapbox, throw it down the street and bring it right back to get on the soapbox <laughs> again. <laughs> hit us up. We'd love to have an idea conversation with you. Brittany, it was amazing. Thank you for lighting up our brains and teaching us something new and giving us something more to think about than when we started this conversation. And to everybody else, we hope that you will decarbonize and we hope you will join us again the next time Kathy and I take an idea, drop it down, because on this show, like all the time, it's about to go down.